you. And I, I was sort of shell-shocked. For one thing, I had never thought about Princeton because when I was an undergraduate, Princeton didn't admit women. Well, in the next days, I thought about his advice and with the wisdom of a 21 year old, I decided that, okay, I'll humor him. I'll apply to Princeton and I'll apply to Berkeley. And if I get into Princeton, I'll go there and I'll do astrophysics. I got into Princeton and I went there and did astrophysics. This is the graduate college at Princeton where at that time anyway, graduate students and I lived. And at Princeton, I decided to do my thesis work with Jim Peebles, who many of you probably know won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2019 for his work, for his theoretical work on the galaxy distribution. He was just beginning, he was an assistant professor at that time, and he was just beginning to try to understand how galaxies are distributed in the universe. And when I went to see him about projects, he suggested to me that I ought to think about what I could do with the then largest map of the universe. It contained a whole 500 galaxies with 3D positions, two coordinates on the sky, the latitude and longitude, and the redshift, which gives us the distance. This map reached to a whopping distance of 100 million light years. I analyzed that map and I, what I did was to try to measure the mean matter density in the universe, because people were already thinking about the domination of the matter density by dark matter. And actually I obtained a result that's not very far from the mean density that people derive today. This field has advanced enormously hand in hand with changes in the technology. And the main two technologies technologies that have driven the advance are digital detectors, CCDs, which of course you all know, and especially large format cameras, and fiber optics, which have enabled the measurement of, or the spectroscopy for many, many galaxies at once. Today, in 2022, there are 15 and a half million galaxies with redshifts reaching into the very distant universe. And I'm going to show you how our understanding of the distribution of galaxies has developed. So let's step out into the universe. Of course, the first step is our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And here you see a glorious image taken from Las Campanas Observatories in Chile. The southern sky, I don't know how many of you have been to the southern hemisphere, but the southern sky is much more spectacular than the northern sky because you can see the center of the Milky Way. You can also see these very dark lanes, which are dust in the plane of the galaxy that obscures our view. I like to say that has astronomy grown up in the southern hemisphere rather than in the north, no one would have thought that we were in the center of the galaxy. Also from the Southern Hemisphere, you can see two companions of the Milky Way, the small Magellanic Cloud and the large Magellanic Cloud. The large Magellanic Cloud is about 160,000 light years from the Milky Way, and it's about a tenth of the mass of the Milky Way. We know now that the outer halo is formed of much smaller galaxies that have been disrupted in collisions with the Milky Way. So the first thing you see here is that galaxies don't walk alone in the universe. They have companions. And in addition to these small companions, the Milky Way has a large companion, which you can see with your naked eye from the Northern hemisphere of the earth. In fact, these three galaxies, the large Magellanic cloud, the small Magellanic cloud and uh, Andromeda, are the only three galaxies that you can see with your naked eye from the surface of, from the earth. You can see Andromeda, of course, in the fall sky um, as a fuzzy patch on the sky. Here you can see that Andromeda also has friends and here is one of them. Andromeda is about two and a half million light years from the Milky Way. 
and it's coming toward the Milky Way at a velocity of about 250 kilometers per second. And it will arrive here in about four and a half billion years when it will collide with the Milky Way and make a mess. That's about the same time the sun will become a red giant. So it's not too good to be around in the solar system at that point. So this bunch of galaxies, Andromeda, the Milky Way, and their satellites form the local group. And the universe is full of groups like this. But it also contains much larger concentrations of galaxies. And here's a famous one called the Coma Cluster. This cluster is about 300 million light years from us. And it, the galaxies in it look very different from the Milky Way. The Milky Way, you could see it has spiral arms and it has young stars in those spiral arms. These galaxies are red and dead. They're not forming stars anymore. And in the densest regions of the universe, essentially you have only galaxies like this, which are just piles of mature stars. The most massive galaxies in the universe live in these very dense regions. So these galaxies are about 10 times as massive as the Milky Way. So the Milky Way is about a trillion solar masses, and these are 10 trillion. A cluster like the Coma Cluster contains a thousand galaxies or so comparable in mass with the Milky Way. In 1933, a man named Zwicky, who worked at, Pal at, uh, at um, let's see, at where did he work now? Um, Carnegie, Obser Carnegie Observatories and Caltech uh, measured the velocities that these galaxies move with relative to one another in the cluster. And he did that for a few galaxies. And then he applied uh, Newton's laws to calculate the mass of the cluster. He found an amazing thing that there was so much matter in the cluster that he couldn't explain it with the light, but the stars that must be responsible for the light from the galaxies. So he concluded that most of the matter in the universe must be dark. This was 1933. Dark matter in the universe has been an enduring mystery. We now know a lot about where it is, but still, after 90 years, we don't know what it is. In fact, we know now that most of the matter in the universe is this mysterious dark matter. In fact, 84% of the matter in the universe is dark matter. And we don't detect it directly. So it has to be made of stuff that doesn't interact strongly with light and doesn't interact with other material. Only 16% of the matter is baryons, the normal stuff we're made of. So not only are we tiny in the universe, we're not even made of the major constituent of the universe. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, my wonderful friend and colleague Vera Rubin measured the way uh, stars move in galaxies at large radius and demonstrated that in galaxies like the Milky Way, they live in a halo of dark matter. And in fact, the model today is that every galaxy in the universe and every cluster of galaxies lives in a halo of dark matter. And one of the issues that we want to discover is how the light emitting matter in the universe traces the dark material. And this is one of the goals that we have in mapping the universe. And we've learned a lot about that, but there are still issues that remain, particularly on the largest scales. So now let me tell you a little bit about how we go about mapping the universe. When I came to the Center for Astrophysics, people had an idea about the way matter was distributed in the universe. They thought there were clusters like the Coma Cluster that had a thousand trillion solar masses or so, and that those were the biggest structures in the universe, and that these clusters were randomly distributed in a sea of little groups and individual galaxies like the Milky Way and its friends. 
when I arrived, shortly after I arrived at the CFA, um, this telescope, a 1.5 meter telescope on Mount Hopkins in Arizona, was instrumented with a digital spectrograph. Mount Hopkins is located just north of the Mexican border, uh, not very far from Nogales. This 60 inch telescope was one of the first instruments in the United States to be instrumented with a digital spectrograph. And with that, you could measure these redshifts of the galaxies one at a time. So for galaxies in the nearby universe, and by nearby now, I mean within something like 700 million light years, it took half an hour to 45 minutes per galaxy. Initially, I, I was working with a colleague named John Hakra, and initially we used this telescope to more or less follow in the footsteps of Zwicky. So we measured the relative velocities of galaxies and clusters to determine the mass of these clusters. And we found just as Wiki had, that they were completely dominated by dark matter. The more I thought about it, the more I thought that there was a much bigger, more interesting question. And that was, are there bigger patterns in the universe? Are people really right that clusters are randomly distributed in a sea of otherwise randomly distributed galaxies. So here you can see the catalog of galaxies, the positions on the sky that Zwicky and his colleagues actually made. So what they did at that time, there were no digital detectors. There were just uh, photographs of the sky. So people took photographic plates with Schmidt telescopes, and these plates detected about 1% of the light incident on them. So they weren't very, they didn't go very deep into the universe, but Zwicky and his colleagues painstakingly measured the positions of 13,000 of these fuzzy objects in the northern sky. And here you can see a plot that shows the distribution where each point represents one of the galaxies in the Zwicky catalog. By looking at this plot, you can sort of see why people thought there were lumps of galaxies like this, say, or this, and then kind of a sea of others sprinkled around. And that was it. So they had a 2D idea, not a 3D idea. So the question I had is, are there big patterns in the universe? And then the question is, how do you find it in a finite amount of time? Because the universe is big and life is short. So I thought about, suppose you were going to ask this question about the surface of the earth, does it have big patterns and what are they? Well, if you took a tiny patch of the earth, mostly it would land in the ocean, you wouldn't learn anything, but if you take a great circle in almost any orientation, it will pass through continents and oceans, and you'll find out that there are two kinds of structures both big. So by analogy, I suggested to John that we map a slice of the universe. So what we would do is take a strip across the sky, which is outlined in red here, and uh, the strip, of course, it's going to be 3D, so it's like pulling a slice out of an orange. So this would be the surface of the orange where the red is, and then the, you, the, the slice goes into the center of the orange. The slice has to be wide enough and contain enough galaxies that the, if there is a pattern, you could see it. So John agreed, I suggested this project to John and he agreed that it was a good idea. And we suggested it to a student who was visiting from the University of Paris to do her thesis uh, with us, Valerie de Leperon. So in 1985, we measured, painstakingly measured the redshifts in this slice one at a time. How do we do that? To measure a redshift, you need to disperse the light from each galaxy out into its colors. And so here, just as a reminder, are two ways of doing that. One is, of course, a prism, and the other is a grating. This is just a, C a reflective grating, a CD acting as a reflective grating. And in the spectrographs for astronomy, we use gratings to disperse the light. So now let me show you what happens due to the expansion of the universe. 
So we know that the universe is a stretching space, a very odd idea, but the space between the galaxies is actually stretching. And as the photons from distant galaxies travel through the stretching space of the universe, their wavelength stretches. And that produces to longer and longer, redder and redder wavelength. And we call that stretch the redshift. Now, to give an example of that redshift, I show the spectrum here of hydrogen. So hydrogen is the most abundant uh, element in the universe. And that was actually discovered by Cecilia Pankapochkin working at Harvard in the 1920s. So this red line is the H alpha line at 6,563 angstroms, and then you have H beta, H gamma, and so on. So now let's see what happens as the light propagates through the stretching space of the universe. So what happens is that these lines shift to redder and redder wavelength and the fractional shift of all the lines is exactly the same. So what we measure is the fractional change in the wavelength of the lines and that fractional change is proportional to the distance of the get to the galaxy for nearby objects. So the red line, so when this stops, the, the red shift will be not zero, but 0.4, which by today's standards is not a big red shift, but by the standards of our first survey was an enormous red shift. So in that year, we measured redshifts for a thousand some odd galaxies in the survey. Now, John Huckra and I were educated at Caltech and Princeton where everybody knew the answer to my question. There weren't any bigger patterns in the universe. When we saw the result for our map, we were stunned. This is it. This is a map of the first slice of the universe, which we first published in, in early 1986. So let me describe what you see here. First of all, there is no doubt there's a pattern that fills the map. So we sit here and look out into the universe. And the edge of the map, the surface of the, our slice, runs perpendicular to the screen here and the distance to these galaxies at the outer edge is some 700 million light years you can see that there are some huge empty regions called voids it was known that there were voids but what wasn't known is the relationship between where the galaxies are and the voids so you can see that there are some big regions where there are no points and these are 230 million light years across the points, the blue points, represent galaxies that are forming stars, galaxies like the Milky Way, and the red points represent galaxies that are red and dead, like the objects that inhabit the coma cluster. And in fact, this torso of the stick figure here is the coma cluster. Now you might ask, why in the world is it elongated like that? It ought to be some kind of round ball. Well, it's elongated because the redshift we measure consists of two contributions. One is the contribution from the stretching of the fabric of space. And the other is the contribution from motions of objects in systems of galaxies. And those motions produce a stretching along the line of sight pointing toward us. And it was by measuring the length of this finger that Zwicky first discovered the dark matter in the universe. And within a factor of two or three, he got roughly the same answer we get today. You can see that the rest of the galaxies are in very thin structures which surround or nearly surround these vast empty regions. And today this structure is called the cosmic web. This slice changed people's perception of the way galaxies are distributed in the universe. It showed that there was a large scale coherent pattern and it asked the question, how does it originate? 
we have a variety of ways to understand how the pattern forms and evolves. And basically there are two. One is we can simulate it on a computer. And the other is that we can continue to observe deeper and deeper into the universe. Fortunately for us, the universe is sort of a time machine. As we look out in space, we look back in time and the entire universe, the entire history of the universe almost is there for us to see. At ages at 400, when the universe is about 400,000 years old, at times earlier than that, the universe is opaque. So the earliest epoch we can see is the image brought to us by the cosmic microwave background, which shows us the time when the universe cooled enough that uh, matter and radiation were no longer hooked together and photons could stream through the universe. This slice began what I like to call the age of mapping the universe. And as I said, it was in 1986. Needless to say, Valerie de Lepron got her PhD and became a permanent staff member at the Institute for Astrophysics in Paris. John Hucker and I continued to map adjacent slices of the universe. And by 1989, we'd mapped four of them and we wrote an invited article for Science Magazine called Mapping the Universe. And the graphics for that landed on the cover, as you can see here. So here you can see this structure. You can see the coma cluster. You can still see these big empty regions. So the structure persists through these slices. And this huge structure persists over the entire northern sky and became known as the Great Wall. It's a huge coherent structure, 700 million light years in extent, much larger than the structures anybody thought existed in the universe. Of course, we couldn't find any structure bigger than that. This is about the biggest structure that could fit in our map. And we continued to measure redshifts until we had measured a redshift for essentially every galaxy in Zwicky's map that I showed you initially. In early 2000, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey began an ambitious project to go deeper into the universe. And in fact, the Sloan reaches a depth about three times what we could, and they use a dedicated four meter telescope um, uh, in, in Arizona. I should comment that there are diff different ways, and this will come up a little bit later in the talk, that for many facilities, people in astronomy apply for time. So for example, if you want to observe on JWST, you apply for time, and there is a time allocation committee which allocates you some amount of time. And the same thing is true for ground-based facilities. But there are also dedicated space missions, like the Gaia mission, which some of you have heard of from Europe, which mapped the galaxy. That's a dedicated mission where people don't apply for time. It just observes the sky. And now for ground-based uh, applications, there are also dedicated facilities. Um, and so there is a big change in the way people make these observations. So the Sloan, Digital Sky Survey was, I think, one of the first dedicated ground-based uh, surveys, and it set out to image the 25% uh, of the sky and to measure one and a half million nearby redshifts. So we measured 13,000, they measured one and a half million. And here you can see a slice of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, of the Sloan Survey. So here, green are the galaxies that I made blue, so the ones that are forming stars, and orange are the ones that are red and dead. The depth here is a little more than 2 billion light years, so about three times the depth of our survey. And you can see the same kind of structure, large empty regions and thin structures where the galaxies are. And of course, the Sloan contains a great wall here, and it's a bigger survey, so it can manage to contain an actually bigger, apparently coherent structure. So this, the amazing thing is that the first slice, our first slice was just deep enough to reveal the characteristic way that galaxies are arranged in the universe. Now, how does it get this way? For that, we appeal to simulations. 
So we know from observations of the cosmic microwave background that the early universe was extremely smooth. So the background radiation has very small variations in temperature, which tell us how big the matter fluctuations were when the universe had an age of a mere 400,000 years. We can put that we have a spectrum or we can say how big the fluctuations were, irregularities in the matter distribution were as a function of how, how big they were. And we can put that as an initial condition into a computer. So this is an image, a slice through a simulation that follows 10 billion dark matter particles that trace the matter in the universe. And so here you can see that in an age of two tenths of a giga year, the matter distribution was fairly smooth. And you can see that there are some small low density regions and there is a cluster like the coma cluster that's going to form right in the center. And there are other lesser condensations throughout. Now in an expanding universe, gravity does a funny thing. It makes lumps grow and it also makes holes grow. So things fall into the lumps and they rush out of the lower density regions, both. And as you'll see, they make a structure very similar to what we see. So here's the dish. Now this is the distribution of the dark matter, not galaxies. So here we see what it looks like when the universe has an age of a giga year, you can see the cluster is bigger, the voids are deeper, the cluster is bigger again at an age of 4.7 giga years, and here at 13.6 giga years, almost the age of the universe, 14 giga years, we, we have a cluster like the coma cluster, and you can see this web-like structure, and you can see there are other clusters. More recent simulations, of course, computers have gotten faster and bigger. So now you can trace not only the dark matter, but also the gas and the particles that may, and trace the formation of stars. So here's an image of a bigger simulation. And these are the uh, group headed by Volker Springel at the Max Planck Institutes in Germany. The simulation is called Illustris. And the blue underlying stuff is the dark matter and the gold and white are galaxies. So here you can see the galaxies that inhabit a cluster and you can see how they trace these stringy structures. And we can use these simulations to develop ways to analyze the data and to try to understand how structure develops in the universe. And in fact, my colleagues and I have used these simulations to develop a technique for measuring <clears throat> the way clusters accrete material over the history of the universe. And we've applied that to the survey I'm going to describe to you now, HectoMap. HectoMap is a survey carried out with two of the largest telescopes in the world. And the goal was to map the middle-aged universe. We, the survey is now complete but it took much longer than we thought, partly because of climate change. So climate change has made the MMT, which you see here on the left, a much more efficient, le less efficient telescope than it used to be. So uh, the problem is that the seeing is much, much worse. And so, the, and so it's much harder to, to use the instruments we have to do spectroscopy efficiently. So on the left, the MMT, which is a six and a half meter telescope that we use to do the spectroscopy. And on the right is this 8.2 meter Subaru telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, which we use for imaging. And it has the currently largest digital camera in the world, a gigapixel camera um, called the Hypersuprime Cam. And that, uh, so from that, we get the imaging. This is an image from hypersuprime cam of a cluster in the hectomap region. So this cluster is 4 billion light years away. And uh, the hectomap survey surveys 
hundreds of clusters at this kind of depth. If you look carefully, you can see that not only are there these piles of stars, but there are these elongated blue things. So there are two of them here, one here, and there's one here. These are gravitationally lensed objects that are 10 billion light years away. So what happens is <clears throat> that the matter concentration in the cluster bends the light from distant objects and distorts them. And by measuring the properties of these lens galaxies, you can measure the mass of the cluster. Remarkably, in 1937, Zwicky, who was a brilliant man, suggested that ultimately we would only know the masses of things in the universe from gravitational lensing. It was a prophetic statement, because now that we can do gravitational lensing, from images like this, that's turning out to be the most powerful technique we have for measuring the matter distribution in the universe, particularly on large scales. The spectroscopy for HectoMap, which is what I do, is done on the MMT. And uh, I have to say, every time I see this picture, I think about how amazing it is that we can do this at all. So what happens is that photons, which are emitted in distant galaxies billions of years ago, travel through the universe unimpeded. And they hit the primary mirror of this telescope, or reflected to the secondary, and back to the instruments mounted in the focal plane. And uh, we interpret those photons that we detect to discover the structure of the universe and how it got to be the way it is. It's actually mind boggling. It's pretty amazing. The focal plane of the MMT has a number of instruments, but one of them is this instrument, the HectoSpec, which was commissioned in 2004. And when it was commissioned, it was one of the leading instruments for spectroscopy on the large telescope in the world. It was one of the early, one of the first robotic instruments. And you can see there are two positioners here, which position these metal sleeves uh, at the carefully measured positions of galaxies in a one degree field on the sky. Each of these metal sleeves carries an optical fiber. The optical fiber is, uh, is uh, glued to a little prism, which can look up through a hole at the sky so we can collect the light. And there's a magnetic button which pins the fiber to this surface, which conforms with a metal surface, which conforms to the focal surface of the telescope. With this instrument, there were 300 fibers, and we can measure redshifts for about 250 galaxies at a time. The other 50 fibers are necessary to measure the sky because one of the hardest things is to subtract the sky. And uh, so it takes an hour and a half, roughly, to measure redshifts for galaxies at 10 times the distance of those that we observed with the one and a half meter. We've measured 100,000 redshifts with this instrument in the HectoMap survey. And now I'll show you what that looks like. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing with it. So first, let me give some coordinates here. So this is another slice on the sky. And it's a thin slice in declination, one and a half degrees. Uh, the slice for the first redshift was survey was shallower and six degrees wide. And you can see the right ascension is running along the outer rim here. The radial coordinate is the redshift that we measure. And from that, we can uh, we can use the cosmological model to say what time it is in the universe. So on the lower uh, axis here, we measure, we have the age of the universe at this coordinate. And so we're looking back here, we're looking back approximately a giga year, here two giga years, three giga years, and at the outer region, we look back six giga years of the history of the universe. 
I might mention that galaxies at sort of the average depth of this survey, planets in those galaxies, probably life is just originating as it was originating on the Earth at about this epoch. So I like to see how the uh, structure builds up, and I'm going to show you a movie that shows how it built up as we made the observations over the last uh, more than a decade. Um, so this movie was made by Juby Son, who has just gone to Korea, back to Korea. He was a postdoc working with me, and he's returned to Korea to be a professor at the top university in Korea, Seoul National University. So each one shows one of the hectospect fields, and you can see that galaxies know exactly where to be. You can see that there are empty regions and thin structures where the galaxies are. The color coding just shows you it's redder as you go to higher and higher redshift. You can see that here, as in the shallower survey, and you can see there are still galaxies being added, but you can rare, barely see it because they're going where galaxies already are. So the Sloan survey is, a, is about to the depth of this arrow. <laughs> you can see that the structure is very similar to the structure in the first slice. There are empty regions, thin structures, and there are also clusters, but it's hard to see the fingers. And the reason it's hard to see them is that their length is very small compared to the depth of the survey on the coma cluster where the length was large compared to the depth, so the finger was obvious. So one of our goals, as I said, is to measure how the structure develops. And the way we do that in this survey is to identify the clusters, use simulations to guide us to make a tool to measure the rate that clusters grow at, and we apply that tool to the data and see whether or not it agrees with the simulations. So first we have to find the clusters, and here each of these white circles shows a cluster and we identify them by finding the densest regions in the survey where there are red and dead galaxies. You can also see two beautiful Subaru images of these clusters, one at a redshift of a half. And again, you can see these strong lensing arcs, which will help us to make an accurate measurement of the mass of this cluster and that's underway using this lensing. And here is a more nearby cluster where you can see the details of the nearby galaxy. So um, let me just go back and show you the movie once again. So you can see again how, so a few of these, you can see the very dense regions where the clusters live and clusters grow. Clusters accrete more than half of their mass over this epoch in the age of the universe. And that's eminently measurable, it turns out. Another project we have underway is to use the Subaru data to measure the masses of these clusters using lensing, both the strong lensing that makes these arcs and something called weak lensing, where there are very tiny distortions of galaxies, but we have lots and lots and lots of galaxies in the Subaru images, so we can measure that. And not only can we measure the masses of the clusters, but we can measure the whole matter distribution traced by galaxies. So we hope to be able to constrain the way galaxies measure the matter distribution on the largest scales. And we, we can do that by slicing up this survey and uh, comparing it with the weak lensing map that we make based on the Subaru imaging of this entire 50 square degree region. Well, the next steps in the exploration of the universe already underway, well underway with again a dedicated facility. So this is a picture of the four meter telescope on Kitt Peak. And it's now instrumented with an instrument called the Dark Energy Survey Instrument. This instrument enables 
the measurement of not 250 redshifts at once, but 5,000. So you saw that the hectospec, the robots move and move the fibers in the focal plane. The new instruments have little, uh, are just completely tiled with little robots which don't move very far in the plane. And so you can measure thousands of galaxies at a time. The collaboration that's undertaking this survey includes hundreds of scientists and they have already measured several million redshifts. Their goals are different from the goals of Hectomap. So the goal of Hectomap was to trace some of the densest structures, clusters, and the goal of this project is to measure the cosmological parameters and, and uh, to examine the structure on scales of hundreds of millions of light years, rather than to focus on the very densest regions and the way <clears throat> these systems trace the structure. So it's what we call a sparse survey. But since it's a dedicated instrument, it will probably continue and ultimately be a dense survey. I have to comment that when I think about projects like this, it makes me feel a little bit wistful because I feel that I was very privileged to be working in this field at a time when three people could see this structure for the first time. And I have to say that when we saw it for the first time, it really was awe-inspiring. And it was an amazing feeling to be one of the first three people to see this structure. And for a few minutes, it was ours. Now it's very different. Uh, and, and it's been a pleasure to shepherd the careers of younger people working sort of one on one with them. So the Hectomap survey is a dozen people, not a hundred. And from people are very different. So from my perspective, I have no interest in working in a collaboration of a hundred people, none whatsoever. Even though the progress of these surveys is spectacular, it doesn't attract me as a scientist at all to be part of it. I want to close with a personal story just as I began. I've had some remarkable experiences in my career, and one remarkable one was to receive an honorary degree in 2009 from the University of Tarragona in Spain. Tarragona is a town near Barcelona. Tarragona was originally built by the Romans. It has a Roman amphitheater and a cirque, and the Romans went there to stop Hannibal. What they didn't know was Hannibal had already gone. In any case, you can see here that the Spanish win the prize for academic regalia. All of the gowns have this beautiful silk hood and the color of the hood signifies your field. Also lace sleeves and the hat, which it has a Moorish uh, influence. When I was, Honorary degrees in Europe are very different from honorary degrees in the United States. In the US, they're associated with commencement and the honorands don't give a talk and there's no special, there's no really special ceremony for them. But in Europe, there are very few honorary degrees. A university might give one or two a year. And the it's a it's a whole day celebration for the honorand. A lot of eating. And um you also give a talk and when i was thinking about the talk i looked up the history and so on of tarragona and i learned that one of my famous favorite artists miro had spent the last part of his career in tarragona I knew that Miro, when he was exiled from Spain during the Franco era, painted a series of paintings called Constellations. And I thought that he might have written something interesting about them. So I went to the library and looked at his diaries. And sure enough, he wrote one of the most glorious things I've ever read about looking at the universe. And I'll share it with you. He wrote, the spectacle of the sky overwhelms me. I am overwhelmed when I see in an immense sky, the crescent of the moon or the sun. 
There, in my pictures, tiny forms in huge empty spaces, empty spaces, empty horizons, empty plains, everything which is bare has always greatly impressed me. And I like to say that it's the job of astronomers, astrophysicists, to discover where the objects are. So I'd like to close with Moreau's reminder to look up at the sky and wonder, and I'll take the liberty of replacing his star with a galaxy. Thank you very much for inviting me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So does anybody have a question they would like to ask Dr. Gill? So uh, the most obvious question to me is if all of the galaxies are on the webs of the structure, what's in the middle? It's empty. Completely empty? It's empty. There is no dark matter there either. No, the dark matter is pretty much you could see in the simulations the dark matter is concentrated um let's see why can't i oh i guess i'm not am i not sharing anymore or i stopped your sharing so that we could see you on the screen but you're oh i see okay hand. well you can see in the simulations you can see that the galaxies trace the dark matter is trace trace the dark matter it's empty Um, now, the, the Great Wall is the structure that sort of demonstrated this idea that this is the way that the galaxies congregate and mass congregates. As we've gone deeper, have there been any more notable structures like that? It's that complicated because the real question is, what is an individual structure? So the Sloan has the Sloan Great Wall. And some people have argued the Great Wall is an individual single. It's pretty clear that it doesn't have some components, but the Sloan Great Wall, some it's larger than the Great Wall, but some people have argued that it's actually composed of three structures. The issue is understanding whether the structure is bound together by gravity or not. And that's very hard to measure, it turns out. So there have been a number of claims of larger structures, but it's very hard to understand whether or not they're individual structures. So the main way that people look, mainly the way people look at these structures is to calculate all kinds of statistics which measure the properties of the ensemble of galaxies in a survey. And so that's what we generally compare with the models. So although it's the quote unquote biggest structure that attracts public attention, what really attracts the scientific attention is the ability to have a large enough survey that you can characterize what's going on. So the goal of Hectomat, for example, was to have enough clusters, and there are something like 450, that you can measure how they accrete material during this period when clusters accrete so much of their mass. And uh, so that's really the goal of these surveys to survey a large enough volume. And it's the goal of the DESI survey to survey a huge volume reaching far into the universe so that you can trace its evolution and you can measure the aggregate properties of the way the galaxies are distributed. Yeah, we have a question in the back. Can your computer simulations be run from the present forward to predict how the web is going to evolve in the future? People do do that. The question is, um, do we project forward? And people do do that. So, for example, people simulate the local group and ask what is going to happen when Andromeda and the Milky Way collide. It's a true mess. Uh, but yes, people do simulate the future, and that depends on the parameters of the universe, which is one of the reasons people want to understand the parameters of the universe and the na nature of the dark matter and the dark energy, which is responsible for 70 some odd percent of the energy density of the universe. So the physical nature of those things determines the future, and people do simulate, you know, they, they can keep running the simulations. So they don't have to stop when the universe is 14 giga years old. They can just keep going. 
but they can also start with what we observe. So you can start with the observed parameters of the local group and you can simulate what will happen to it. I think there was another question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, since the uh, James Webb telescope will be gathering infrared data, yes, we'll be looking even further back in time. What yes. do you think are the implications of data from that source? Well, I mean, people will see, they'll learn a lot about galaxy formation because the J JWST will show us directly the epoch of galaxy formation. And there's a lot of speculation about how galaxies form and how they interact, how what happens as matter falls in. So the idea is that the dark matter halos form first, the baryons we're made of cool into those halos, form stars, and then there are the galaxies we see. And that, that model will be tested in a way that it's never been tested before by JWST. There was another question. Yeah, go ahead. Have you been able, on the uh, diagram you showed in the beginning, have you been able to determine where the great attractor is and also the area where the great attractor is being? Formed? Oh, the great attractor is not is not in the in, in the region that we map. It's in the it's more toward the southern hemisphere, but. Uh, and and it's 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 pretty near to the plane of the galaxy, but it's a pretty nearby thing actually. It's it's a bunch of clusters of galaxies. I mean, it's it's absolutely nothing that unusual. In the end. Okay, we, uh, any other questions? All right. Anybody on Zoom? No. No. Okay. Yeah, I think we're I think we're set. Well, Margaret, thank you so much. You're here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Mr. Walsh is up next with a second motion. <laughs> okay, well, in May, uh, we had a talk about the Radio Jove 2.0 project, which is a basic radio astronomy uh, activity, which studies high frequency emissions from the sun and Jupiter. Now, those who are, are long-term members of uh, skyscrapers are familiar with the so-called skyscraper weather. Almost every time we schedule an activity, it winds up being cloudy. So right now, it is partly cloudy. It was clear this afternoon. It's going to be clear overnight. But during the time we want to observe, it's going to be somewhat cloudy. So Linda and I were going back and forth and saying, you know, maybe we ought to get into radio astronomy because the damn clouds don't matter. <laughs> and coincidentally, in May, we had a talk on a basic radio astronomy project. So what I made, I'm making a motion to spend no more than $400 on the Radio Jove 2.0 kit, which consists of a software-defined receiver, wideband software, uh, software-defined receiver, some antenna bits, cabling, and software which will allow us to observe uh, emissions between 16 and 24 megahertz from the sun and from Jupiter. Now, the interesting thing, particularly with regard to the solar emissions, is that, of course, you know, the sun has a huge influence on radio communications here on Earth. And I've been reading a few papers recently about various, uh, various aspects which are just being recently discovered about how the ionosphere propagates radio signals and how solar activity uh, affects that. We're at the start of solar cycle 25. Solar activity, magnetic field activity is ramping up and it's having significant impacts on radio communications. There are particularly involving the high frequency, high frequency bands. There are a number of citizen science projects underway that are making use of this hardware. So once we get something like this up and running here, we can actually have the opportunity to participate in some actual uh, studies that are gathering data and resulting in publications. And this uh, the hardware would be located would be located here in this building. The idea being to just to uh, gather data, twenty four hours a day, extract the data once in a while, have a look and uh, catch things, basically catch things that happen and compare our data with that of other sites. So I'm going to make a motion to allocate no more than four hundred dollars uh, to purchase the kit. I can save the club money by building the antennas myself. Otherwise, it'd be another $120. So they make the motion to purchase the Radio Jove 2 kit. And 
associated antenna supports for no more than four hundred dollars. Do I have a second? Sir. Okay. Okay. So this will be discussed and voted on at the next meeting. Thanks, Linda. Okay. Okay. I guess we're done for the evening.